Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those that are joining for the first time, my name is Vicki Bowden and I am the project manager here in HOP. I'd like to welcome you all to our summer research seminar series. Um, before we begin and I um, introduce Dr. Zhao, I do have a couple of items I'd like to share with you all. So the first, we do have a Q&A feature. We ask everyone um, that has questions to submit them there. And um, Dr. Zhao and I will um, address them at, later on in the seminar. If there are questions we aren't able to cover, um, he will be answering questions via Twitter or email. And we'll share that information um, as well with all of our, our attendees. Um, and after this session, you will be receiving a survey that we ask you um, to complete. It allows us to get feedback um, on the seminars and to gauge your experience. If you've missed past recordings um, of seminars, you can view them on our YouTube page, um, HOP Summer Student Program, and we recommend all to subscribe and visit our page. So for today's talk, Clinical Trials and Translational Research, we have Dr. Jimmy Zhao. Um, he obtained his Bachelor's of Arts in Molecular and Cell Biology at UC Berkeley and then pursued a joint MD-PhD at UCLA California Institute of Technology. After graduation, he completed an, an internal medicine residency at New York Presbyterian Cornell Hospital. Currently, he's a medical oncology fellow here at MSKCC. He specializes in genital urinary oncology, specifically prostate cancer clinically and at the same time he's doing laboratory research in the lab of Dr. Charles Sawyers to understand the mechanism of drug resistance to targeted therapy in prostate cancer. His goal is to become a physician scientist who cares for prostate cancer patients in the clinic and at the same time run a research lab that focus on, focuses on understanding cancer pathogenesis and mechanisms of drug resistance. Again, we welcome Dr. Jimmy Zhao. All right. Thanks, Vicky, for that introduction. And my name is Jimmy Zhao. Uh, I'm a medical oncology fellow at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, it's a real pleasure, a pleasure and honor to be here this afternoon to the next hour to really talk to you about uh, some of the basic concepts, introduction to clinical and translational research. And so this is my Twitter and email at the bottom. So if you have any questions about anything after the talk, feel free to contact me. So I'm gonna start, tell you the outline. So I wanna first by follow the tradition of tell you a little bit about my career path into science and medicine. And at the same time, so next I'm gonna tell you with some concepts about clinical research and translational research. And to really, um, and then use a real drug example, prostate cancer drugs, uh, I commonly prescribe in the clinic enzalutamide as an example of a successful story, which is not that common in academia, basically from all the way basic translational research all the way to FDA approval. So a little bit about my career path. So just to give a sense how we got here, how what got me interested in science and medicine, hopefully that can inspire you to consider science and medicine uh, as a career, consider uh, research as the components of your future research career, whether from basic research, translational, clinical research. So first I was gonna say you guys uh, way ahead of the curve. So when I was at your stage, I wasn't definitely not thinking about research. All right, so I always thought I was become a physicist, a mathematician or engineer or something growing up. And, and but, so my first real research experience actually is after sophomore year in college at UC Berkeley. So I did a summer internship uh, at the Argo National Lab, which is just outside of Chicago. So I was in the lab at Dr. Raj. So she studied, she's in the chemistry division. So I learned basically to, to, uh, to use titanium dioxide nanoparticles and to integrate that with biomolecules uh, as a potential application. So it was a really fun experience eight, 10 weeks, and then I learned a lot, but frankly, with such a short period of time and being my first research experience, I didn't get much done uh, for the, my first experience, but that got, got me really interested in doing more research. So after the summer internship, I came back to Berkeley. So I did an undergraduate research for my last two years at UC Berkeley. 
in the lab with Dr. Paula Timuris. Uh, she unfortunately passed away uh, 10, 12 years ago. So um, she was trained as a physician, but she's kind of doing research as a main focus of her career. So it was my first time doing research trying to understand uh, a human disease problem. So we're trying to study how we can induce uh, neuron production, neurogenesis from another type of brain cell, glial cells, and for the potential treatment of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, it's my first exposure to really a disease-oriented research that really got me excited. So thinking, oh, geez, the science is very interesting and stimulating, but if we can do science for the benefit of, of human health and human disease, that would be even more amazing and rewarding. So that was my first start interested in pursuing MD-PhD programs. And, and knowing if I can do medicine and science together, that would be really awesome. But I think one thing that was underestimated is really uh, the length of time for this particular training path it would take. So, and after that, so I decided to first pursue a, a cancer research fellowship at National Cancer Institute, really venture east. Um, to Maryland, Bethesda, to see do I like East Coast? Uh, do I want to stay on the West Coast for my further trainings? So it's also I want to learn a little bit about cancer research. So I was studying a oncogene, actually one of the first oncogene discovered for RAS, how they can promote breast and colon cancer metastasis in the lab with Dr. Kathy Kelly at the National Cancer Institute. So I really loved it. Cancer is such a fascinating problem. It's a, such a major public health problem. So, and the modeling, the mouse modeling, et cetera, and signaling was very uh, intriguing to me. So because of that, that was one of the reasons I later pursued medical oncology uh, as a clinical specialty and continue to do clinical re uh, 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 cancer research today. So, but honestly, that I really did not like the location. Washington DC was to my standard at the time was really cold compared to California. And then especially in winter, it's very windy to me. So I really hated the location, but really enjoyed the experience. So then I decided to stay back in California uh, for my MD-PhD training. So I enrolled in this joint MD-PhD program between UCLA and Caltech. So you start with medical school for the first two years. And after two years of medical school, you go to a PhD. And, and that's what I did my PhD at Caltech in the lab of Dr. Baltimore, uh, David Baltimore. So he actually is... Uh, actually got a Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of reverse transcriptase at the age of 37, so which is interesting. So by the time I'm 37, probably I'm still just about to be done with my training. So uh, he already got the groundbreaking work and got his Nobel Prize at 37. Um, so in the lab, I was studying how inflammations affect hematopoietic stem cells, as well as how chronic inflammation can really induce leukemia development. So it was a really fun four years. After the PhD, I went back to medical school, finished my last two years of medical school. So at that time, you already did eight years of training. So I felt great about science. I kind of get a sense of how what research is, how it's done. But honestly, after the MD, clinically, we really low, know very little about clinical medicine, which is ironically for most uh, MDs after just med school, uh, we really do not have enough experience or, 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 or knowledge in terms of taking care of patients. So you have to do a residency training in any specialties of your choice. So in order to become a medical oncologist, so I have to do internal medicine first. So I, now I finally took my time and, and, and went back to the East Coast now in New York. So I did my internal medicine training at New York Presbyterian Cornell across the street. And currently I, I'm in my last year of uh, oncology fellowship at MSK. So clinically, as Vicky mentioned, I treat prostate cancer patients for the most part. And then by the same time, I'm doing laboratory research in the lab of Dr. Charles Sawyers. So I'm trying to understand the mechanism of drug resistance in prostate cancer patients that are treated with antiangiogen therapy. So some of the lessons and tips I learned along the way in my career training so far. So one is really, if you haven't that heaven, you can tell by now, the science of medicine, the journey can be very long and challenging. But at the same time, it's very rewarding, intellectually stimulating, but you really have to be passionate about medicine and science and research to really enjoy the journey and really to make it through in one piece. Um, 
So also, as you can see in science and medicine, in fact, in any career path, try to explore different areas, different fields early on to see what really captures your interest the most. Because you want to do something that you're really motivated and you're really passionate about. Um, identify good mentors and colleagues along the way. So they're going to be your good support system. And you can bounce your ideas off. You can be a, a future collaborators. And, and some of the really important skills I found during the training is really time management skills and the ability to multitask. Um, and also in life or in science and medicine, you have to be curious and persistent. Uh, there are going to be a lot of failures along the way. Uh, you have, you don't, you, you don't, you can't be afraid of the failures. You have to learn from them. So in order to be successful next time. So that's kind of my career path. If you have any questions about MD, PhD programs, or in fact, just so many different colleges, schools I went to, um, feel free to contact me. So now let's get into a little bit about the topic today, the clinical research and translational research. So I'm gonna introduce some basic concepts. So basically the idea is to get the general overview and backgrounds about the topics and don't really get bogged down about the details. So clinical research is actually pretty well defined. So essentially any research that study a human beings so, or even the data of tissue sometimes uh, you generate from human beings, from people to try to understand health and disease. So that's clinical research. So the goal of clinical research is to really find better way to detect, diagnose, treat, and prevent disease. So, but there are many flavors of clinical research. I wanna just give you a sense of, it's not just uh, clinical trials uh, one way or another, there are many different flavors. So what are the different types of clinical research? So one of the more common ones is treatment research. So what does that do? You basically try to study a new intervention, like a medication, a new surgical techniques, radiations, or new device, or sometimes even like psychotherapies, acupunctures, anything, the interventions, and to see whether they can benefit uh, people or help treat disease. So that treatment, but they are prevention research as well, which is try to see if lifestyle changes Vitamins, vaccines, minerals, or even the medication can help prevent a disease from ever developing. So like, for example, losing weight, um, uh, increased exercise, does that help with reduce cardiovascular disease or cancer, et cetera. Those are considered prevention research. And there are diagnostic research. We still look at diagnostic tools, diagnostic tests, and then there's screening research. For example, can you find better way to detect cancer early? So some of the examples, including uh, 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 use of a PSA, which is, uh, stands for prostate specific antigen, it's a blood test to screen for prostate cancer. That still remain like controversial whether everybody uh, should be screened for it. Um, another thing is like using CT chest to screen for lung cancer. This actually being found to be beneficial for uh, heavy and chronic smokers. Um, and there are quality of life research, so sometimes how people feel in life and the quality of life also is very important. So their research to understand how particular illness or how particular treatment affect the quality of life. And their genetic studies, uh, there are also epidemiological studies, which basically essentially follow cohorts of patients, usually a large group of patients to see is there associations between a particular disease and a, a risk factors. One of the, I think the most famous examples and uh, is actually finding the link between tobacco smoking and lung cancer. So, and that's like, you, as you mentioned, that's a huge public health implications. In fact, actually, lung cancer uh, is extremely rare before World War I and World War II, and that risk like rise exponentially after World War I and World War II because the soldiers during the war, they were actually smoking tobacco to try to relieve stress and anxiety, and they kind of brought the habits back home when they returned and then all of a sudden, tobacco smoking become like a social norm, actually acceptable, actually encouraged in a social setting. And you can see epidemiology start to find a link between rising lung cancer incidence and the rising tobacco smoking. And some really smart epidemiologists put two and two together, and they found out there is a strong plausible link between tobacco smoking as a cause of cancer. And through many other studies, experimental research-wise and other epidemiological studies, finally, uh, people convinced in tobacco companies are convinced that 
the, the smoking is um, a major cause of cancer today. So that's epidemiological studies. So clinical research can also be categorized as observational versus interventional. So observational, basically, you don't really intervene with a new treatment, et cetera. You watch a group of patients. For example, you watch a group of non-smokers and smokers just naturally and see what happened to them. Do the smokers get lung cancer more frequently than non-smokers? Uh, that's kind of observational. Interventional studies is you intervene. You have a new treatment, a new procedures, and then you try to see if it could change um, the, how the, the rate of disease development. So clinical trials is one of the major forms of interventional study. So what it does is test new medications and new procedures uh, on patients to see whether the new interventions uh, are beneficial to the patient in whatever disease they have. So because clinical trials sometimes keep, are doing new medications, new procedures first in humans, um, so patient safety, as you can imagine, is of a, a paramount importance. Um, you want to do it slowly, rigorously, and you want to protect this, the patient's safety to make sure the medications or new procedure are not doing harm to the patient instead of helping them that was intended to do. So clinical trials are done in phases. So there are phase one, two, three clinical trials. So what's phase one clinical trial? Basically, you start with a very small group of patients and you try this new treatment for the first time. So the really the central questions for phase one trial is asking, is it safe? Um, and then what are the, some of the side effects it has? And then you try to determine the safest dose to use, all right, uh, uh, the maximum tolerated dose to use for the future trials. So sometimes in phase one trials, we really treat like one patient at a time. You give to one patient, and give a month or two to see uh, how the patient does. Does it cause any side effects unexpectedly? And can a patient tolerate it before you give it to the second patient? So it's, it's doing, it's, you do it slowly and, and carefully. So if the drug and new treatment found to be safe in the phase one trials, and you move on to the safe phase two trials. So phase two trials is really when you start to ask the questions, is it effective? So now you're giving the new treatment to a larger group of patients and you continue to monitor the safety, of course, and then but you're asking to see, do the new treatment shrink tumors, for example, in cancer patients? And then if you see some evidence the drug is effective and obviously needs to be safe, then you can move on to the phase three trial, which now you're testing into a much larger group of people compared to phase one and phase two trials. And, and sometimes you have to compare it to the standard of care. What's the currently available, the, the standard of care, you have to see if your new drugs uh, is better and safer than the current standard of care. So the gold standard for the phase three trial is what we call a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. So it's a mouthful. So randomized meaning the patient, all the physicians don't get to choose. It's like a computer process, randomly assigned patient to either to getting the new treatment or getting a placebo. And then double blinded means both the physician and the patients, like no one knows either they got a placebo and they got a, they got a drug. So you would, so for example, if it's a pill, uh, the new treatment, then you get a placebo pill that looks just like um, the control, the, 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 the drug, and then so neither the patient or the physician actually know which pill you got. So, and that's usually the standard, the gold standard, that's what usually it's required to get a drug through FDA approval. So if you have a medication that's a home run, really proven to be effective, and it's also safe, you get FDA approval, and now it's patients can be prescribed, we can prescribe it. But sometimes trials don't stop there. You have something called phase four trial or post-approval studies. And what now you basically have thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients taking the drug before a, a, a common drug. Then you really can see is it safe in the much larger populations? Are there like rare but serious side effect that's been missed even in a large clinical phase three trial? So there are actually medications even after FDA approval but found to have some rare but pretty serious side effects and have been pulled off the market um, afterwards. So those are the different phases of clinical trial.
So about translational research. So translational research is a, a much less precisely defined uh, research area. So in theory, in general, what we call translational research is any research that's done in laboratory, in the preclinical setting before moving into humans that have the potential to be moved into humans into a clinical trial and eventually become effective therapy if it's effective. So it's what we so-called a bench to bedside approach. So what that means is bench, it's a laboratory bench. You do your science, your laboratory research in the lab. If some findings are very uh, promising and can be used uh, to benefit the patient, then you try to move that research uh, into the bedside, into a clinical trial settings. That's the bench to bedside approach. It's usually what we define as translational research. So, and this is all sound pretty abstract, right? Translational, basic, clinical. So I think one of the best way to kind of get a sense of it is actually use a real example of a therapy that started in the laboratory and finally to an FDA approval. So take you through the journey of the translational research all the way to different phases of clinical trial and eventually to FDA approval. So this is a drug I'm partial to because I prescribe, uh, we prescribe to the prostate cancer patient all the time. It's also because it's co-discovered by my mentor, Dr. Charles Sawyers and his colleague uh, at UCLA, uh, Michael Jiang. So enzalutamide, this drug works by blocking the androgen receptor, which is a receptor that prostate cancer use to basically detect testosterone in your body and then use as a fuel to grow. So enzalutamide basically blocks that receptor uh, interaction with testosterone and that they starves prostate cancer cells of the growth signal they require to grow and they arrest and they die. So it's FDA approved now to treat different stages of prostate cancer. And I'm gonna use this as an example of how translational research and clinical trials are done. So before I get into the real examples, I wanna give you some background so to help you understand prostate cancer and the treatment. So first I wanna start with some statistics. So prostate cancer, one of the reasons I chose prostate cancer, it is the most common cancers in men other than some common skin cancers. Uh, one in six to nine men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime. And one in 40 will die from it in the United States. So it's a huge public health disease burden and problem. And so prostate cancer, just like many other cancers that go through, they progress through stages. So for example, like many solid tumors, lung, breast, and they start with localized prostate cancer. So prostate is this gland in the male reproductive system. Uh, it's required for reproduction um, in men. So however, as people get older, um, prostate cancers, prostate cells can accumulate mutations and become cancer. So usually it starts in, as a localized prostate cancer. So in this area, if it's found early, if it's localized, the patient can be treated with surgery or radiation. And the goal is to cure the prostate cancer. And unfortunately, um, a portion of the patients, they, the prostate cancer will recur as metastasis or sometimes patients are diagnosed later in their stages and they present as metastatic disease. So this is a stage they have already have spread from the localized place to lymph nodes or bones, two of the most common places of prostate cancer spread. And then, but they haven't had any like systemic treatment. So they are in a stage we call castration sensitive prostate cancer. So it's a, it's a horrible name, but that's what people came up with way back then and we continue to use it. Castration, really means surgical removal of the testicles in men. So pretty barbaric back then, but it's effective. So even, so not too long ago, actually how prostate cancer treated is surgically uh, remove the testicles, which is the source of testosterone and the prostate cancer will shrink. So that's the stage when the prostate cancer is still sensitive to this castration therapy. We call it metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. However, so, and another name for castration therapy is called androgen deprivation therapy. Sounds a little more civil. That's actually uh, what we do nowadays, a much more civilized approach. Instead of doing surgery, we give a shot. Uh, in, in one of the drugs is called Lupron. So basically you give a shot in the body that tells the brain, shuts down the production of testosterone instead of going through the surgical procedures. So if you treat patient with this androgen deprivation therapy or castration therapy, 
that eventually the prostate cancer cells will learn uh, to become resistant. So very smart. One of the main problems of cancer treatment is development resistance. So, and then, the, then they will be at the stage of what we call castration resistant prostate cancer or CRPC. So this stage, um, it's much more difficult to treat. And fortunately nowadays, we have many more tools and drugs we can help with the patient. But even just 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have much to offer to these patients. They, have, they can get some chemotherapies, which is for, work for a little bit with horrible side effects, and then patient will become resistant and eventually die from their CRPC disease. So a different ways to look at this is uh, in this diagram, basically in a time course uh, uh, progression, and this is a tumor volume or PSA, which is a marker for prostate cancer. I mentioned that if you have local therapy at the beginning, some patient will be basically um, cured, but some patient will relapse and you give an androgen deprivation therapy for the patient who are castration sensitive, they will respond for a period of time, but eventually almost all of them become resistant. At this point, so what do we do? Back then, we just have chemotherapy or some other drug that didn't, uh, that didn't really work very well. And, but nowadays, because of the research, uh, the newer drugs um, that now we have much more to offer to patients. So a little bit more um, background on how cancer become resistant to therapies. So um, one of the sim very simplified model and diagram for cancer evolution is like this. Imagine you start with the normal cells in your body and then you basically accumulate mutations, you become cancer. And then, but cancer cells like to mutate, so it doesn't stop there. You continue to acquire additional mutations, continue to divide. So now you start to basically spread out all these different clones with different, uh, different sets of mutations. And then some of the mutations will make them more likely to metastasize. So cancer is inherently a very heterogeneous population of different clones of cells. So imagine if you start with a heterogeneous population of cells, you give a therapy, that might be effective in 99% of cancer cells. However, you may have a clone, a very small amount of cells that are resistant to, uh, to this particular therapy, like androgen deprivation therapy. And then they eventually they will learn to grow again and you relapse. So that's why they become resistant. So as you can see, it's extremely important scientifically, clinically to understand how are these resistant clones different from the initial cells? What are the mechanisms that make the cells resistant? If we can find out the mechanism, can we come up with the newer therapies to overcome that resistance? Um, so I'm going to use the example of androgen deprivation therapy resistance um, as as a, a, as example here. So it was at, mentioned that it was first actually discovered or, or a pioneered by a surgeon, uh, Dr. Charles Huggins. So he actually won a Nobel Prize for discovering using hormone treatment for prostate cancer. So back then, again, we still doing mostly surgical castration or sometimes to give estrogen, like a female hormone, to men to try to suppress testosterone. But nowadays, what we do is we start to understand a little bit more about the physiology of testosterone production. So here is the brain, the brain, a part of the brain called hypothalamus that gets signaled to another part of the brain called anterior to pituitary gland, which through various signals will tell the testicles to make testosterone, which makes about 90% testosterone in the body. There's still about 10% testosterone that may at different places like adrenal gland or sometimes prostate cancer cells itself. So nowadays what we do is we give a shot, something called GNRH agonist or antagonist, and then that will tell them, shuts down the brain signaling and you will basically shut down the production of 90% testosterone. Normally that's sufficient. For most cancer cells, initially they see so much testosterone flow in their bodies. If you reduce by 90%, most cancer cells will not be able to tolerate they will basically stop proliferating and they will die, okay? That's why the androgen deprivation therapy works. However, there are some cells that start to learn to adapt and somehow they can start to grow again in the, in the, in the context of very low amount of testosterone, less than 10% they can start to grow. So one way they can start to grow, it's actually very smart. So what they do is just focus on this part here. They actually amplify the receptor for androgen receptor which is what they require. It's like an antenna uh, inside the prostate cancer cell, right, to try to grab onto the testosterone uh, androgen here. So, and what they can do is, if they have like 10 copies normally, they probably won't be able to capture much of the signals. 
But if they increase the copy of the engineering sector tenfold, hundredfold, now you have a hundred, a thousand copies. Now all of a sudden, the prostate cancer cells can grow in the, in the absence of very low amount of testosterone. That is one of the main resistant mechanisms uh, of prostate cancer become resistant to androgen deprivation therapy. So, and you can imagine, geez, what if we can reduce the production of testosterone even further, cut out the other 10% of the testosterone in our body, perhaps get rid of all testosterones, perhaps that would be effective. That's essentially in one of the currently available therapy called abiraterone, how it works, shuts down the production of testosterone in the adrenal glands. So that's effective in castration-resistant prostate cancer. So the other way is imagine you can block the interaction, block the androgen and testosterone interactions. So that's how the enzalutamide works, okay? So once you block that signaling, the prostate cancer no longer can no longer see testosterone and they will, they, will, they will start to die again. So how this is all sounds pretty simple, right? Straightforward. No, it takes like 10, 20 years or more uh, for drug to from initial discovery in the laboratory all the way to go through clinical trials. So I'm gonna give you quickly go over this enzalutamide as how it was initially discovered as part of the basic translational research and how they go through all the way to different stages of clinical trial. So this is a, one of the first papers that uh, uh, study by Dr. Charles Sawyers when he was here at UCLA. He really tried to understand the first, what's the mechanism of resistance to androgen deprivation therapy. Back then we didn't know. So one of the way to do it is use mouse models. So we can't direct study humans right at the beginning because, and then we use cell cultures and mouse models to do this initial studies. So what it was done at that time is basically you have all these different cancer cell lines. The name is not important, but they represent different cancer cell lines uh, from prostate cancer patients. They initially all sensitive to castration therapy. However, if you give this uh, uh, cancer cells and grab into a mouse, it will start to grow. And then what you can do is just like the humans, you can surgically castrate the mice and most of the tumor cells will shrink because they are initially castration sensitive. However, if you give enough times, many of the cells will start to grow again, much just like in the clinic. So now you have a two cell lines from the same cell lines initially. One is start with castration resistant and then you become castration resistant. Now you're asking, what are the differences? What's the changes? So back then, they're still doing a technique called microarray. Um, but nowadays, we will be using RNA sequencing. So basically, you're asking what are the differences, the transcript level, gene expressions between the castration-resistant castration clone to the sensitive clone. So one of the things they consistently see, if you see the rise, it's a higher level of androgen receptor transcript in all the cell lines. So, and different ways to look at this, something called Western blot, which you get the protein levels of expression. So the darker the band, meaning there's a more androgen receptor. You can see in each pair here consistently, you see a, 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 a darker band when they become castration resistant. So now you, you see the first basic association. There's an increased expression of androgen receptor that is associated with castration resistance. So the next step is you're asking, well, if it's association, does it actually cause the resistance? So to do this, fortunately, experimentally, there's a way with like molecular techniques with viruses, we can overexpress the androgen receptor. Basically, you start with a cell line, a prostate cancer cell line that's castration sensitive, and you basically give a virus that produces androgen receptor at much higher levels. You can see the darker band here. So this cell line uh, was engineered to express higher level androgen receptor compared to the control. And you asking, now you in induce the expression of androgen receptor, you overexpress it. Does this line become castration resistant? So, and the answer is yes. So you start, start with in vitro, like a cell culture system. So you here, you see, this is the control cell lines, which are castration sensitive because of castration therapies. Um, it basically stopped growing. And then here with the line with the overexpressed androgen receptor, you see it doesn't really care about castration therapy and which is a, in a form of very weak androgen receptor inhibitors, they continue to grow in cell culture. How about in mice? So it, it shows the same thing. So if you see this uh, basically the incidence of tumor growth over time, and this is basically intact mice, meaning you, you don't give any therapies. The cancer cells, whether they have many copies of androgen receptor or not, they continue to grow because they have cancer cells. Um, they grow equally well. But however, if you give a therapy like castration, you can start to see the normal, the, the link cap prostate cancer cells is sensitive to castration. 
But if you overexpress the androgen receptor, all of a sudden it becomes resistance. Now you, you're basically demonstrating a cause, causal relationship. You can overexpress the androgen receptor. Now you can cause this castration resistance. Okay, some of the common things we do in, in, experimentally. So how about the other way? The, other, the opposite of the experiment. So now you start with a castration resistance cell line. Can you downregulate the androgen receptor and see now you can make it sensitive to androgen therapy, deprivation therapy again. So that's essentially what was done here. So there's again molecular techniques you can you can downregulate gene. Here they use something called RNA interference. But nowadays we also have something called CRISPR Cas9 technologies. So very good technology to uh, knock down a gene. So here they make the cell lines. So basically using RNA interference you basically see significant reduction of androgen receptor. Now you compare those two cell lines in mouse in the pro. See, when there's a high AR expression, androgen receptors, um, the prostate cancers are resistant to castration therapy. But if you can downregulate its genes, now it becomes sensitive to castration therapy again. So this is a very important like proof of principle experiment, right? Showing like, Jesus, if in patients, we have a castration resistant cell line, only if we have a very good, very potent inhibitors, a drug that block androgen receptors, perhaps we can see what's been seen here in, in, in mice. We can actually make the cells uh, sensitive to androgen therapy again. So that really is what the translational basic research has done. So the next step is, can we find those potent inhibitors of androgen receptor? That was what's done. So I'm going to skip this part. So that was what's done, essentially. Um, a collaboration between Dr. Sawyers and Dr. Jiang at UCLA, who is a brilliant chemist. So what they do is, they basically, that's what medicinal chemists do. They basically screen molecules or they synthesize molecules to try to find a drug that have the properties to block a particular drug target in this androgen receptor. So they screen like over hundreds of them, 200 of them molecules, and they finally found some hit. One is called RD162, which with minor modifications became a drug that we currently, we, uh, uh, nowadays use today called abalutamide. The other drug called MTV3100, uh, which become enzalutamide, which is a drug that's also FDA approved today. So it's a very successful screen, that one screen that come out with two FDA approved drugs. So that's actually really works. So this is one of the basic biochemistry studies to see the binding. Does your drug bind the androgen receptor better? So, and the details are not important here, but just to show this black line here, basically it's a binding affinity of a natural ligand, DHT, it's like a testosterone uh, analog. It binds very tightly, right? So with a very low amount of concentration can bind it. And on the other end, this red line here is a drug called bicalutamide, was the weak AR inhibitors that we had in the clinic back then. So that was the best available drug at the time. You can see those two new molecules basically have significantly improved binding affinity to androgen receptor compared to the bicalutamide, the five to tenfold. Although it's still not as potent as a natural ligand, but still is a five to ten fold improvement in the binding assays. So the next is asking, okay, you put it in mice, you treat in mice, can they basically stop uh, prostate cancer from growing? This is basically done in mice in what we're using a technique called luciferous imaging. So what happens, you, inge uh, you engineer a prostate cancer cells that can emit light uh, when you give a substrate called lucifer luciferin. So basically the more intense the light, the bigger the tumor. So you start it on day zero, you see to two cohorts, one here is basically untreated. The other cohort here is you're given this one of the drugs. You can see on day five, the one that get this RD162 drug has all the intensity reduced, meaning the tumor shrink. While when you get the, the, the control, it continues to grow and it's persistent. So it looks like it's effective. A different way to look at it is in this, what we call waterfall plot. So which is actually what we commonly use in clinical trials as well. So in this yellow bar here, it's all the different, uh, different mice that has tumors growing. So it normalized to 100%. You can see with bicalutamide, you can slow down the growth a little bit although it's not 100% and, and then they don't really shrink the tumor, they kind of slow down the growth. And look at the new drug, the RD162, almost every tumor shrinks by 50%. So very effective in the mouse model. So now with all this translational research, translational data, now finally you have the confidence to say, this is such a promising drug, let's move it to the clinic, okay? So, and this is basically, a phase one study, you start with phase one study to look at the safety. 
So before we go in there, which I want to uh, introduce you to this site called clinicaltrials.gov. So if you go onto this website, basically all the clinical trials are required to register on this website. So on this website, you go into it, you can search for any sort of clinical trial that's currently available. And then this is the one of the initial phase one study of MDB3100 in patients with castration resistant prostate cancer. So on this side, basically you can look at the title of the trial, you can see um, what, what's the study descriptions, how the study design is a phase one, phase two or phase three, and then how many participants are they are looking to, to recruit. And they also have what are the aims of the study, the drug used, the outcomes measured. So what are we measuring? Are we measuring the overall survival, um, the quality of life, or the response rate, et cetera? So usually the most important primary outcomes in a, in a clinical trial is overall survival, but there are other secondary outcomes we sometimes measure. So, and then you look at what are the patients trying to study here? They including adults, children, male and female only. In this case, obviously, it's so male only for prostate cancer. And then what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? So, and then they will tell you where are the sites the study is carried out. You, you, it's not every hospital in the U.S. Or, or in the world have this trials going on. So they sometimes take different sites. Some they're only very limited sites. So they tell you where are the locations of the trial. Okay, so then let's get to the results of this combined phase one, two trial. So this is the first 30 patients that treated with this enzalutamide drug. And this is a PSA response curve. Just remind you, phase one, we look at, is it the drug safe? So it's shown to be pretty safe and there's actually um, minimum side effects in this case. And then now you start to look at, is it effective? So one of the ways to look at efficacy in, in prostate cancer is just to look at a PSA response. So PSA is a very sensitive markers um, that's made by the uh, prostate cancer. So if their PSA decline, then meaning your cancer cells are either uh, arresting, dying, stop growing. So in the first 30 patients, you can see, wow, there's close to 50% of patients have their PSA drop um, by 50% or more at 12 weeks. So that's pretty impressive Consider all those patients back then, uh, they already failed androgen deprivation therapy. They failed chemotherapy, some of them. And then what they really left with, really not much of going on. So many of those patients, what they have treated with what we call best supportive care. So what that means is really, we don't have any more um, anti-cancer drugs that are known to be effective for you. So we're gonna support you. We're gonna treat your symptoms, pain, blood transfusions, if you're anemic and you need transfusions, but there's really not much else we can offer in terms of treating cancer. So, and for a subset of patients like that, you can see if you get a 15 PSA response and 50% of them, that is pretty impressive and promising. So, which is why the, tr the, the, tr the drug move on to phase three trials. So in phase three trial, it is a multinational phase three randomized double blinded placebo controlled trial. Uh, their mouthful, right? So it's done in many different countries and you recruit a much larger patient uh, populations. It's randomized. So in this case, actually two to one randomization. So for every three patients, two of them will get the, uh, the, the drug and one will get the placebo. And so we'll blind it. So physician and the, and the patients don't know which drug they got they or the placebo. And the primary outcome here is the overall survival, as I mentioned the overall survival, how long the patient lived, it's one of the most important outcomes in the clinical trial settings. But there are secondary measures, meaning how long does it take for the cancer to progress, and does it help with pain symptoms, does you have a, what kind of response rate do you get in quality of life, et cetera. So that's actually led by Dr. Shear, uh, which is a, a, a geomedical oncologist here at MSK. So, and that was published in 2012 in New England Journal of Medicine. So this is the most important figures of the trial, which is the overall survival of Kaplan-Meier curve. So what that really shows is basically uh, the survival of the patients. So the top line here is patient who got the enzalutamide, and the bottom graph here is patient who got the placebo. And this is based on y-axis is overall survival, the percentage of the survival, and the y -axis, the x-axis is the month. So you can see. Over time, you can clearly see a, 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 a obvious separation of the two curves. So the patients got, uh, on the enzalutamide arm live longer. So the medium survival is 18.4 months compared to 13.6. So it's about five months improvement in overall survival. 
So another thing to look at it is another statistics method is called hazard ratio. So what that really means is a patient's uh, the likelihood to die at any given point. So you can see the hazard ratio is 0.63, meaning for at any given point, actually the patients on the enzalutamide arm are 37% chance less likely to die compared to the placebo. And the p-value is to look at whether this is random or it's a statistical significant. And usually 0 0.05 is the cutoff. Here it's less than 0 0.001, so it's statistical significant. So that's like a really as good a result as you expect. So overall survival is improved in patients. And also all the secondary outcomes are also significant. I didn't have the time to show it here. And the other thing we look at is the adverse events. What about the side effects? And in fact, the enzalutamide, which is a pill, you take four pills a day, and then, and actually it's very well tolerated. So target therapy in general have very different side effect profile uh, compared to chemotherapies. And in general, they don't make people feel miserable and people generally tolerate it better than chemotherapies. Um, and you can see the only one of the significant side effects is a low percentage of seizure patients. Uh, seizures happen in patients that treat with enzalutamide. But everything else is very comparable between the enzalutamide and the control group. So that what got to the FDA approval in 2012. So, and this is basically four pills a day. Now patients uh, can live longer and, 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 and the cancer can uh, progress slower. So on this pills. And this is a New York Times article covering it. And there's all some of the leading uh, scientists and clinicians on, on to, for this truck discovery, Dr. Sawyers, Dr. Sher, and Dr. Zhang at UCLA. So that's basically the end of my um, covering about the science. So I wanna just uh, 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 go over a few slides just to give you a sense why I think cancer is important problems and why research is important. So to give you a sense, maybe to try to inspire you to consider research, science or medicine uh, as a career uh, for your future. So this is basically a figure showing the statistic. So cancer will soon eclipse heart disease, cardiovascular disease altogether as the leading cause of death in the US. So it's a, one of the major public health problems. And however, the good news is the cancer death rates continue to drop in the US, okay? So we're seeing we're making tremendous progress from say 1990s to 2016, and the cancer death rate continue to drop in men here and in women, meaning we're making tremendous progress because of a, a better diagnosis, uh, better treatment, surgery, radiation, um, better drugs like target therapies, immunotherapies, uh, cellular therapies like CAR T cells, uh, uh, et cetera, that we have available nowadays that's not available back then. And, and this is another way to showing the five-year survival. So basically, this looking at, at five years, what percent of patients still alive for a particular cancer. From 1977 to 2013, you can see a significant improvement in five-year overall survival across all cancers. For example, prostate cancer here is really impressive from like 68% to 98%. And but however, if you look at here down in pancreatic cancers, it's an improvement, but still the survival is basically pretty poor uh, from 2%, 2 percent, 2.5 to 8.2 percent. You can see there's tremendous progress we made, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. So, and this is a basically a new era of oncology drugs. You can see this is number of drug approved, new drugs approved each year by the FDA to treat treat cancer. And you can see over the last two decades, uh, also there. And there are usually 10 drugs or so, uh, up to 20 drugs approved each year uh, to treat oncology. Just to give you a comparison, FDA usually approves uh, up to maybe 50, 60 drugs a year. So a third of them, or, or, or a little bit less than that, are oncology drugs. That's compared to all other disease combined. So it is an uh, uh, area that oncology drugs are approved, uh, invented at a faster pace than any other time in the history. So with that, I want to stop here and want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any time left. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhao, for such a great presentation. I'll go ahead and start with the first question. And perfect. So Arush Bardwaj asks, so you mentioned that there is still potential for rare side effects to arise from the intake of drugs and medications after they have been past the various stages in clinical trials. So can this phenomenon also occur in the case of vaccinations? 
Um, and can vaccinations be rendered ineffective after having passed the different stages of clinical trials? Uh, yes, yeah, a good question. Yes, um, drugs, probably almost all drugs have side effects, big or small. So the key is not to find a drug that have no side effects, probably that never exists, including vaccinations. But the problem is the, what kind of side effects are they safe in general? And then can we mitigate the side effect to some extent? So particularly vaccinations, yes, vaccinations have side effects. And if you remember ever babies, then you, you get a vaccination shot. The, the site basically got swollen, you have some pains, that is a side effect. And then sometimes some vaccines will de- induce fevers in the first week, and that will subside, goes away. That's a side effect. So those are all side effects. In terms of long-term side effects, um, so at least all the big trials, all the solid evidence and data really do not support any sort of major long-term side effects for most of the, the vaccinations we have available proof in the, in the U.S. today. So I know there's a lot of kind of sort of voodoo science or not so great concrete science or false data that say maybe there's a link to autism, there's a link to other things, but I don't think none of any of them can prove it. So with many of the vaccinations, I think it's an important thing in the setting of COVID and flu, et cetera, everybody should get vaccinated unless there's a contraindication. There are people who are allergic to some of the components of vaccination. They cannot get vaccinated, sure. But for majority of the peoples, I think vaccination is remain the best thing to protect you from a particular disease, infectious disease that can potentially be fatal or severe. Okay, great. Um, another question is from a anonymous attendee. They ask, how long does it take um, typically to get approval from the FDA on these drugs? Um, depends or varies. So, I mean, I think the, the part is not once you have all the solid data, it's like you have done a phase three trial that looked very good, you send it to FDA. That usually the process is it's it's months, maybe a year or two, depends on there are other issues, manufacturing safety, et cetera, that have to be looked at it. But it's to get to the phase three trials, right? You can see there's tremendous science, translational basic research that needs to be done to understand the disease. And then you have to go through phase one, two, three trials very carefully and meticulously. So that takes the most amount of time. So 10 years or plus, it's a pretty typical a time frame for a drug to go through all the clinical trials. Once you have the phase three data, the company usually submit it to the FDA as a new drug applications. FDA look at it if the data looks solid, their expert panel review, they will review the data themselves. They will basically approve or disapprove, depends on what they think the data is. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Lily Schneider asks, would a researcher modify the purpose of a clinical trial if they find that it was not effective in the original purpose of the study, or would they stop the clinical trial altogether? Right, right. Okay. It's an interesting question. I think we're getting some of the nitty-gritty details. Okay, so it's a very interesting, a good question, though. So, um, so that's why the clinical trials, you have to write a protocol. They have to be approved by IRB, by many of the basically, and you have to basically say, this is the trial, how it was supposed to be done, and what are the patients we're looking at, what are the primary and secondary outcomes, okay? So, and then that get basically centralized to like say clinical trial that of everybody looking at it. And, and that's basically there. You cannot change the protocol or you measure how you do the study without revising the protocol. Yes, there are cases that the researchers, the, the clinicians have to revise the protocol for good reasons. For example, they found that there's some side effects or the way they're doing this not the best way to do it. They have to rewrite the protocol, to amend it, gets approved, and then you tell the world, okay, this is how I modify it, how it's going to be done beforehand. So you cannot, once you finish the, the trial, have all that data in hand, you try to say, oh, how can I change the results and the way to analyze it? to make it look like it's actually working when it's actually not. That's not allowed, that cannot be done. So you have to do it before the trials, before you have the data. Okay, great, thank you. So Stephen, often, how do scientists find rare side effects in phase three trials when the drugs are designed for rare diseases? Um, and how, drug that what, sorry? How do scientists find rare side effects in phase three trials. 
Right, One right. Of them are designed for rare diseases. And his oh, father. Rare diseases. Okay, okay. How good do question. you approach very rare diseases? Great, great. Very good question. So the phase three randomized trials are are generally, I'm talking about more a common disease. So mm -hmm. it's a great question. For rare disease, there are exceptions. So sometimes we just cannot do a phase three trial because there's not enough patients or to do it takes like 50 years to do it. So there's no way to do that before we can give it to the patient. So a lot of times for the rare disease, they are probably just do phase one or two trials or they collect even the, the uh, the, the data from patients directly getting some of the drugs. So they don't usually have enough people to do phase three trials. The other way to do it is some sort of international collaboration, right? So if it's rare here, if you collect all the patients in the world, try to enroll all of them, have everybody, all the clinicians in the world try to do this trial together, then perhaps you can basically accumulate enough cases. But you're absolutely right. In those rare diseases, Sometimes we give a treatment that's only have some evidence in phase one or two trials, or sometimes doesn't even have phase three trials. And then we don't know where side effects. So you see them as they come on. So, and then that's why they need to be, the patient needs to be monitored carefully for, for the side effects. Okay, great. Thank you so much. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. They ask, can teenagers um, under 18 participate in clinical research trials? Uh, yes. So in general, it depends on how the trial is run. If it's for adults, they usually say age over eight, 18. But there are many pediatric patients, right? So there are kids who suffer from various diseases. So there are trials, obviously, for pediatric patients as well. Then those would be basically anywhere from age several months to 18 years old. So pediatric cancer, leukemia, there's many active trials, brain tumors, and then those would basically um, uh, uh, have participants uh, of teenage, teenager or kids or, or young kids. And so the consent process is a little bit different. So now not only you can't just consent a, a, a minor, right? You have to consent the guardians, the legal guardians, their parents, et cetera. So the consent process and how you tell the kids is a little bit different uh, in terms of consent, but the trials can be run similarly as adults. Okay, great. Um, Maggie Peng asks, how has COVID-19 impacted clinical trials? How have researchers found ways to continue their research while keeping patients safe? Right, right. It's a great question. Unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 is a once-in-a-lifetime kind of events that um, create a lot of problems. Research science is just daily life, right? So in their period, at least in New York, that the trials are stopped and the, the research lab was shut down so in a few months. So that was difficult. So now, finally, with the cases dropping, at least in New York area, New Jersey, so now that the clinical trials start to open up again, and then the research lab are opening up again. So it is certainly a, a tremendous challenge back then, but even now, they're still challenging. So it just there's a lot less trials available and, and because of the COVID-19. Okay, great. Thank you. And the last question is, would you recommend um, the MD-PhD path for people wanting to do clinical research with a cancer focus? I see. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, it can be a long and short answer. So it, I think the PhD part is more designed, um, not exclusively, but more towards people who are doing more laboratory-based research. Because the P but there are PhDs, the master's degrees in clinical trials, et cetera. Those are going to be beneficial for patients, for people who are interested in clinical trial um, kind, of, kind, of, kind of training path. So uh, I think for clinical trial particular people, uh, that's what their career go interested in. Perhaps um, I don't think you need a PhD. Um, and you can have an MD and you can learn the clinical trials um, uh, as an MD, and you can get uh, some sort of master's degrees that's particularly training clinical trials. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhao, for um, today's seminar. It's quite informative. Um, and I will just show my screen just to share an announcement for next the next seminar. Sure. So next week we'll be having Dr. Traparna Sen, um, and she'll be discussing animal use in cancer research. And we look forward to you all joining us at that time. Again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.